check. Well, one of our councilmen is uh, out there telling, telling people we're bankers. So. Well, he's got a hammer. <laughs> I just want to warn you, Ron, I, I have a bigger hammer. Yeah. I worked in a Jaguar agency once, so you needed a bigger hammer. Okay. Don't, don't test me. <laughs> Ron, I'm telling you. Myrtle and I have been doing good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're taking criminals off the street. Yes, we yeah. are. Yes, we are. Could we start with a little, you got to hear the, could, could you share that? Absolutely. Uh, there was a young female on the bus, and she was riding the bus. She was 14 years old. And there was a guy that was on the bus exposing himself and doing things you know, to this young lady, having her watch it. And uh, it was videoed, but the bus driver didn't see it, couldn't see it because the person's back was towards the front of the bus. And so the young lady, I mean, it, it, we saw the video, I mean, he was actually exposing himself. I've never seen anything like that. It was yeah, devastating. Yeah, no, it's not a bus, there's other people on the bus. Other, right, and the young 14-year-old uh, got off the bus and uh, the guy went after her. Uh, when, when she got off the bus, he touched her butt. And, uh, and then she followed got off, her off the bus. Right, and followed her off the bus and eventually turned around. We don't know whether or not he went back and tried to um, abuse her or whatever, but we just know that he was doing this on the bus. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen, I think, in my entire life, to do it to a young 14-year-old and she was devastated. I know her grandmother, so her grandmother called me. That's why I was uh, apprised of the incident. And so as soon as the grandmother called me, I said, we have to get on this. So I called Paul from uh, MTS and called the police department and said, you guys have to find this guy. Uh, they were sent the video. The police department uh, looked at it, started uh, trying to track down this guy. And we didn't think that he would be caught because he just, that's how they are. You know, they were never caught. They caught him at 3.30 yesterday, and he's, yeah, and uh, because I told, you know, PD, you have to get him off the street. And so they did catch him, and he's now incarcerated. I think he's done this before, so hopefully he won't get out again, and uh, we'll do whatever we have to do to keep him in jail. Uh, the young lady was devastated. Her grandmother was devastated. Um, <coughs> so this is, you know, Rod and I, like we said, saw the video, and it was just really, awful. It was really awful. And Ron didn't know whether or not he was caught. That's why I had to share it with Ron that he definitely was caught uh, yesterday around 3.30 because PD knew that this was uh, a priority for me. And this our, our biggest concern is that as former cop Meadow would know, a, a guy like this, if this was his first time, he'd be, he would be a misdemeanor. And he wouldn't be, he'd be out in the streets in five minutes and probably do it again. Right. And it appears this wasn't his first it's time. It was not his uh, first time. But I fear he's going to be where he ought to be for, for some period of time now. So yeah. Yeah. it was uh, it's just kind of what you deal with when you're dealing with. Yeah, to do that on, on a bus, yeah, it's just so. really simple. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's a good day. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good public transit. You know, it's a, oh, that woke me up. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, what are we doing here? Let's get busy. The approval of the minutes uh, from the June 9th meeting. Uh, boss was approval. Yeah, I know that. I was looking. Second. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Council President Cole is my second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Got aye. President aye. President oh. oh, sorry. Old habits. Check in here. <laughs> state boss, right? Yeah. Get state boss. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cast the vote, and that is approved. On a four to zero vote, and we will then move on. Is there any public comment? None. That's good news too. Um, good article in today's uh, YouTube. I, I was going to comment on that at the next meeting. Okay. But if you haven't seen it, some good news. Top today. of the page on. B1, for the last couple of years, we've had certain speakers coming in regularly telling us we didn't know what we were doing, we should give up, the courts have ruled, and we took something to the Supreme Court, and we won, and it was on our plan in 2012. 
2011. Is that for the RPP? Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our legal team deserves a round of applause. Yeah. 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 We're going to see Chu today. Mr. Truman, Julie Wiley. Is Julie back there? Oh, yeah, there's right Julie. Yeah, oh. Julie, that's for you. <laughs> that butt's for you. Oh, thank you. Um, I would say if any of you have a serious environmental case that you think needs to be tried, there's a guy named Mike Ziske, who is kind of the godfather of environmental law. And when we interviewed all the attorneys and decided who we wanted, we decided to go with him. And uh, this was not an easy case. And the guy's fantastic. I would just say that. Yeah, as a case of using it again, the county had a major issue that we were in jail. It was a, you know, this was difficult on, I told Gary I had this come out the other way. Okay, and I have been crucified today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you can rightly blame this, but uh, we did what we thought was right. We felt the state and the attorney general and all of the environmental groups were wrong and I proceeded from the to jail. So this kind of victory that I won't be won. Well, that was precedent statewide, too. Yeah. It was. Yeah. yeah, it'll clarify the rules. It was yeah. a governor's executive order, really, as Thank opposed you. to legislative. You know, we're still a state of laws and not edicts. Uh, well, well, from this a smaller week. city, I think, Sandag, for clearing the way for us to get things done without having to go for all the people. Yeah, I, I hope it works for all of us. Okay, with that, uh, we'll go to the review of the draft board agendas. And I should mention, the, before Tim starts, we may s change the order from what you have received, right. the sequence of, uh, of the uh, items. items. So I'm reviewing them. I don't think there's a better sequence here. I'm going to change this. But the, the contents will be the same. Okay. Okay, there are three um, agendas I'd like to go over with you. There's one printed in the the chair mentioned we may change the order, but I'll go through those items. Um, and the other ones I'm just going to verbal um, report on. So item three is the, the review of the July 28th draft board business agenda. Item um, one of that agenda is approval of your meeting minutes from the June meetings. Two is public comments, communications, member comments, and three is your standard actions from policy advisory committees. On consent, we have approval, proposed solicitations, and contract awards. We don't anticipate any new solicitations. But we do anticipate um, awarding the contract the last segment of um, the South Bay um, BOT, the South Bay Rapid Service um, construction. Item five is an annual item that we bring to the board. It's the I Can Meet Fall campaigns um, asking um, the cities and, and member agencies to approve proclamations for Ride Show Greek and Walk, Ride, and Roll to School, one of our two year programs. Um, item six is an uh, annual update on the Equal Employment Opportunity Program here at San Day. Item seven is the annual review of committees and working groups. We'll be covering that later today at, at, at this meeting. Items eight and nine are your standard monthly reports on meetings and events attended on behalf of San Day and report summarizing the actions taken by the executive um, director. And then under chair's report is um, San, Day, San Day governance reform. The chair and vice chair sent out um, a memorandum to the full board um, earlier this month. And so this is to discuss um, AG 805 as well as options for the government to discussions about considering placing a ballot measure or measure um, regarding Senate government reform on the ballot. Under reports, we have um, a good news a proposed budget amendment for the State Route 11 and OTI Mesa B supported entry project. Um, the region um, thinks the, the good work at Southland and the Senate team um, are to be accepting $45 million in new funding to help advance that project and uh, acquire the right away for the new border crossing. Item 12 uh, is an RTIP um, amendment number seven that's going to be a transportation committee. This school makes some administrative modifications, um, including accepting the funding um, for the SR11 and the Item 13 is the 2017 Active Transportation Program Augmentation. Senate Bill 1 made some additional funding available for the Active Transportation Program, both at the statewide level and the regional level. Um, this is to be an update on that item. It's also going to transportation committee next week. 
Item 14 is the 2019 San Diego Forward Regional Plan, the final um, public involvement plan. We received an update on this at your um, meeting um, last month. And then we'd like to add an item um, in response to, to the Supreme Court victory that we learned about um, yesterday and just, um, just spoke about. There's some next steps that need to get done because that item is actually going to be um, sent, to, sent back to the Court of Appeal um, for next steps. And we'd like to bring a closed session item to talk about that. And as the chair mentioned, um, we would propose to really reach the items so they would flow a little better. Um, 15, 16, and 17 year standard continued public comment, upcoming meetings, and adjournment. And then, if I could, I'm going to move to um, August 4th. Um, we were notified that there will be a special meeting of the board on August 4th, and that would be to um, relate to the examination of the measures they have been forecast. Um, the outside investigators, Houston Hennigan, will be here to present their findings to the full board. And then finally, September 8th is the board policy meeting. We have two items for that meeting. One is um, for the State Route 125 toll road, your Southgate Expressway, uh, the 2017 bond issuance, the review of the actual um, the initial draft documents. Um, we're proposing, as we discussed at the retreat, to actually um, refund or pay back the ticket loan for that and uh, the transit loan that was initially approved require the, the facility in 2011. And then the 2016-2017 transfer kind of finance update, we'd like to also bring that from the September um, date to the policy meeting. With that, those are the okay. three, items, three agendas. Are there any questions? Yeah. What day did you say about the uh, prop, uh, prop A? The, um, yeah, prop A. Uh, the new measure A, August 4th. Oh, so it's the August first, 4th. Friday, okay. first, yeah, first Friday in August. Thank you. Then the other August meetings. No, and then um, you know, unless there's something sort of pressing, we propose to cancel the regular business meeting in August. Mr. Chairman, if I might um, at least put on the table that depending on what you all decide or how far mm -hmm. or what you decide to do on the 28th, that we should probably leave at least the month of August flexible so that in the event. Yeah, you had to have a special meeting. We, we could do that. Um, the, the way the legislature, you know, their schedule is, uh, they will work, I believe, next week, and then they go on summer break, and then they come back. And so the AB 805 bill has now made it through both of the policy committees um, in the Senate, and so has to go to appropriation. So that would kind of be the last place where there could be amendments, if any. And then after that, then you know, gets voted by both fourth and onto the governor's desk. So that schedule's you know such that you know when the legislature comes back after its summer recess, there's probably not a lot of time. So depending on what you decide on the 28th, you may want to provide yourself the flexibility to call a special meeting should we need to. Okay. Just to acknowledge we've got a couple members that have been putting a lot of work on this. Yes. Mayor, Mayor Voss and uh, Vice Chair uh, uh, Councilmember Downey uh, participated at this last hearing. Uh, Mayor Morrison's uh, been Mayor very Morrison, involved. Uh, um, Chair Snot. Or Vice Chair Snot. But the most recently, two people here and two people here. Yeah. Okay. And I appreciate that. Okay. Mayor, Mayor Wells has also been uh, involved in attended some of the hearings in Sacramento. Sorry. That's not it's okay. Thank you. Um, we do need to approve the agenda then for the uh, meeting at the 28th. Okay, there's a motion. Second. Here. Second by Councilman Jones. Please cast your electronic votes. <coughs> the is closed, and that's proved unanimously uh, uh, for the members here. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next item. This is the proposed fiscal year 2018 program budget amendments. And Sandy's going to give us a report. Yep. <coughs> um, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to start with So the results of the annual statewide competitive grant process are in. And SANAG has been awarded two new grants. Today we have two items for your consideration. We need to do amendments to the fiscal year 2018 
program better in, that, in order to accept these new grant funds. The first new project is to support local climate action plans in greenhouse gas emissions reduction work in the transportation sector. The project includes development of a web-based data portal to house key data sets related to climate action plan implementation, such as vehicle miles traveled, electric vehicle deployment, and electricity consumption. Tasks also include outreach, training, and technical assistance in using the data portal for sandbag member agencies. Required matching funds will be provided by SDG and E and complementary work element 32011, the Energy Roadmap Project. Program continuation. The executive committee is asked to approve the proposed amendment to the fiscal year 2018 program budget and overall work program to accept $500,000 in Federal Transit Administration 5304 Sustainable Communities Grant Funding. Thank you, and staff is available to address any questions you may have. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah, it's after the grant money is gone. How is, is this, gonna, this program going to have to be maintained or sustained, or who's going to pay for that? Is it realize we're going to spend it all in two years? What, what happens after that? Yeah, so we're, we're trying to build a, a database that will be useful, and hopefully the big cost mirrors at the upfront piece of putting the stuff together. And then afterwards, we would bring it into uh, to our budget process to try to keep it up. So we, Sandag would have to pay for the ongoing after this. Is there any estimate on what that's going to be annually? Um, yeah, so it would be similar to the data searcher tool that we have. So we estimate a couple days worth of staff time to update the data annually. A couple days annually? Okay. So less than 100,000? <laughs> yes. <laughs> just throwing something out here. All right. Well, it's great to have the money in a grant, but I'm just, at, you know, that usually gets the ball rolling, but who pays for it after that? This is about the transportation committee budget. Yeah, probably. Well, I'll probably no longer be chair after that. Actually, <laughs> we're, we're hoping this, that by automating these pieces, there'll actually be some offsetting costs in the long run because instead of having to go pull data every time, it's automated. The waiter will get it. So, but yes, it needs some upkeep. So, uh, and is each city going to have to put in uh, put information in or feed that, or that that comes to you to Sandag from all the different cities, and then and it's updated. Program, we already work closely with, with um, their staff at all of the other agencies to help provide this data, collect this data, and so it'll be, you know, some of the data will come from sources like SDP or, or from Sandag data, and some would come from the memory as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Move approval. Okay, there's a motion to approve. There's a second. All right, please cast your votes. Closed, and that's approved on what is your vote. Sandy, thank you. We might mention that I think we're going to be seeing more of you. Mm -hmm. Tim Watson uh, decided uh, he had, had enough and retired. <laughs> <laughs> and Sandy is going to be his capable replacement. Uh, so we look forward to working with you. Okay. And Sandy Craig, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have one more item. Okay. Um, there's another grant, um, a new project. Is to conduct the initial planning and research efforts to advance the development of a data management solution for analytics to support the agency's ongoing regional transportation performance monitoring efforts. The project will identify agency goals and assess the various user needs with regard to the collection, processing, analyzing, and recording of transportation performance data, and provide research and guidance on the development of data sharing agreements, privacy protection, and data management to enable multiple systems and operators to be integrated in a standardized manner. TDA funds of $90,000 are proposed over the next two years to provide the local match requirements. The Executive Committee is asked to approve the proposed amendment to the fiscal year 2018 program budget and overall work program to accept $360,000 in the Federal Highway Administration Strategic Partnerships Grant Funding and authorize $90,000 in matching TDA funds. <coughs> And staff is available to address questions. Any questions? Uh, the chair would entertain a motion. So, no. 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 Approve. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Uh, it was, yeah, uh, 
the last second of the council member Jones. <coughs> Close and that's a food kind of thing. So well, thank you. Okay, we'll move on now to item number five. You have proposed amendments to the Sandbag Board Policy Number 25. I have that one. Uh, good morning. Uh, Sandbag's public participation plan, which we sometimes refer to as the PPP, provides a broad overview of the principles and practices that Sandbag uses to engage the public regarding its various programs and projects and a PPP is required by both state and federal law. <coughs> Some of the more significant programs and projects, such as the Regional Plan and the Big Coast Trolley Project, then have a follow-on Public Involvement Plan, or PIP. Um, we talked about one of those coming back to you regarding the Regional Plan uh, in September. That are consistent with the principles in the PPP, the higher level policy, but set forth specific public engagement practices that will be applied to those particular projects. Sandag's PPP is set forth in Board Policy 25. That policy was reviewed by Caltrans on behalf of the FHWA as part of its Title VI assessment of Sandag in October of 2016. And that review requested that certain information be added to the policy addressing certain areas, including data collection, Title VI training of staff, complaint processes, Title VI compliance officer contact information, and more specific reference to the federal regulations that govern that policy and that the policy is in compliance with. The proposed amendments to Policy 25 are reflected in Attachment 1 to the report, and that's at page 3 or 23 on your tablets in redline format. And those would address these areas formalizing Sandag's existing public engagement practices. Additionally, other proposed amendments would update terminology to current practices. For example, we now use a regional plan to combine a few different um, other uh, terms that we uh, formerly had, and call for the policy to be reviewed on a more general periodic basis than specifically every three years. And we believe that this would better align those updates with the board policy um, to the board policy with updates to matters discussed in the policy, for example, the language assistance plan, which might not be every three years. When we update these other things, we could then also update board policy 25 in parallel with that on a periodic basis. Again, all of the proposed amendments to this policy are reflective of current SANDAG practices. Pending action today, the proposed amendments to the policy would be released for a 45-day public review and comment period and then return to this committee for further discussion of the proposed amendments and any comments received and consideration of a recommendation to the full board for action in the fall. So the executive committee today is asked to discuss the proposed amendments to board policy 25, attachment one to the report, and accept the amended public participation plan policy for a 45 day public review and comment period. Thank you, John. Today we, we simply have to accept or put it out for us for review. But if you have any questions or concerns, just want to know how do we engage the public? How exactly do we? It really board policy 25 lays out different ways that you can engage the public. Ultimately, on a particular project like the regional plan, the public involvement plan then lays out the specifics, kind of of the toolbox that you have in board policy 25. How exactly those will be employed on a particular project or plan. So the public involvement plan that you will see in September, and it was, I think, for discussion earlier at the board, will lay out, here's how we're going to apply these principles and engage the public on this particular thing that we're doing moving forward in the public involvement plan. So sometimes that can, and we've got our communications team here too, but ultimately, probably now there's a lot more focus on not just social media, um, community, direct community engagement with meetings, different things like that, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. It really depends on the project and what will best engage the public in a particular project or program. Thank you. Okay. More, I didn't know if you were more specifically asking about the next 45 days. Well, what will happen after Today. 45 days? Does it come back? Yeah, to it comes back to us after 45 days. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. With the comments we got in that, yeah. so if we receive comments from member agencies, from interest groups, then we'll bring those 
staff that, okay. uh, with we'll recommendations of how we would address those. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Uh, the elimination of that three-year um, time period, is that because we tend to do things on a more regular basis than in the past? Or is it uh, just because it's such a, a, sli a moving target anymore? I think it's a little bit because probably more so the latter, because the three years of updating this policy don't necessarily align with the time frame that you update these other things that are reflected in here, like the language assistance plan, or sometimes when we go out with a regional plan, we find that we're going to use some new tools that maybe weren't relevant some years ago, and we want the flexibility to be able to address this policy to make sure that those outreach strategies are consistent with this policy. And that might not always happen exactly on a three-year basis. Just to make sure I'm on the stage. Thanks. Okay. I'll move to we have a, a motion by Council President Paul, second by Council This is just to accept. Okay. It's yeah. to accept, not to approve. Right, you're just voting to okay. accept this okay. release. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's to accept. No. Okay, voting is closed. And that's proven now. So yeah, you <coughs> to uh, item number six. This is a review of proposed amendments to the sand egg. Board policy number 12, which concerns the Service Bureau. Yes. John is going to brief us on this. We've, put a, we've had a lot of discussion on this one. We have, just recently. Uh, the San Diego Service Bureau provides information and technical services to member agencies, non member government agencies, and private organizations and individuals. And this committee, the Executive Committee, serves as a Service Bureau's governing body. Board Policy 12 sets forth Service Bureau's policies and procedures. And at its May 12, 2017 meeting, the Executive Committee discussed two Service Bureau procedural issues that are the subject of the amendments that are being proposed today to Board Policy 12. The first one had to do with the life cycle policy for transportation modeling services requested through the Service Bureau. At its May 12 meeting, the Executive Committee approved an eight-year life cycle policy for transportation modeling services. And this direction limits Service Bureau support to the current version of the transportation model and one prior release. And the amendments proposed to Section 5 of the Project Priorities and Procedures section of the policy, that's at page 3 of the report or page 35 on your tablets, formalizes the executive committee's direction into the policy. The second area that was discussed uh, at its May 12 meeting um, by the executive committee concerned the extent to which the Service Bureau would accept work related to legislative matters, propositions, or candidate elections. This discussion arose from requested services related to the Soccer City proposed development. Section 2 of the policy's conflict section page four of the report, or 36 on your tablets, currently contains a prohibition against accepting any work related to legislative matters, propositions, or candidates for public office. The executive committee asks that alternatives for amendments to this portion of the policy be developed for its consideration. And there's probably three different options that we've worked out for you, and there might be others that you see there too. First of all, part of the discussion back in May was just to delete this prohibition. So this alternative is reflected in the redlined version of the policy and would be a change in that it would now allow the Service Bureau to do work in these areas relating generally to elections. The second option is to just keep the policy as it is, to keep the current prohibition language in place. This would prevent the Service Bureau from doing any work on election issues and reflects existing <coughs> general practice. And a third option, which is maybe more a little bit of a hybrid, would to bring any requests for election-related issues to the executive committee as a service bureau's <coughs> governing body for its consideration. Um, the potential language of how that might be implemented um, is near the end of the report, page two of the report, or 34 on your tablets, just above the next step section. And language can be um, inserted to say that the Service Bureau will obtain approval from the Executive Committee for any request for services directly dealing with legislative matters, propositions, or candidates for public office. 
And this third option would provide flexibility, would allow the executive committee to balance both the potential benefits and risks in performing election-related work. So today we're asking for your direction on these or other alternatives to this policy. And based on your direction, any proposed amendments to Board Policy 12 will be presented to the Board of Directors for consideration at a future meeting. So today the Executive Committee is asked to discuss the proposed amendments to Sandag Board Policy 12, Sandag Service Bureau Attachment 1 to the report, and to recommend that the Board of Directors approve the proposed amendments, provide revised language, or direct staff to return to the Executive Committee for further review and discussion. Thank you, John. John mentioned that this is really uh, part of the debate that this came up because of Soccer City. And some of you might remember originally the one of the opponents of Soccer City approached us and asked if we would do a traffic study. Shortly thereafter, the proponents of Soccer City approached us and asked if we would do a traffic study. Now this was before the council had accepted it, so it wasn't on the ballot. So it didn't fall under our existing policies at that time, which had it been on the ballot, we would have automatically said no to everybody. So we were kind of faced with a little bit of a dilemma. And what we did was to say, look, we're going to do one traffic study. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do a traffic study for you and a study for you. So we've got to get everybody in the room. We're willing to do it. But we have to get agreement on what the project is. Okay? You guys can argue back and forth, but let's have Let's reach a final agreement on how much, how many square feet of this, that, and the other, and, and have a basically at least an agreement on what the project is. If we felt then we could go forward with a, a study and uh, and let them argue over what it all means. Uh, the uh, and I should say you, you need to remember this. This is a really good service, and it's at a very effective cost which makes it attractive to people. I think when this was started, I don't think it was was visualized that it was going to be used as a weapon. It was really thought of as something <laughs> positive that people would maybe supplement their own traffic studies and doing a project and you know, get an assessment of here's what's going on and you know, in a bigger perspective. But it's a, it's a good financial deal. It's very low cost. For the, for the work you get, you couldn't go to any private traffic guy right now and get this, uh, this kind of cost if you could get it at all in the way that it's done. Um, so we've got something that's very attractive. I think it's a generally it's been a, it's got you know it's been a positive, and then we ran into this situation as we're seeing increasingly with citizens' initiatives uh, that there's going to be people for and people against. And in this case, both teams. Thought it would be a good idea to, to use us. We're just about completed with that because we went through it and we had to sit down with both teams, let them ask questions about what we came up with. It, it, it got into a very, a much more complicated process because you had two sides. The issue for us, I think, is what role do we really want to play? Okay, and, and, and I think. You know, there's the, the recommendations could be that on a case by case basis you bring it back to this committee and decide. Uh, I just, I, I, I had never thought of us sort of getting engaged in the middle of these controversies. I think the existing policy says stay out of anything that's ballot related. So I just, I share this background, but I have some some real concern saying we're living in a time where you know, there are so many weapons to stop things. That's why you see that you're in the middle of a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. okay. There's every rule in the book to stop things, and we're not getting anything done. And I hate to think that we become more sand in the, in the years here. It you know, uh, can be used to keep things from happening. For that, uh, Mayor Boss, and then. Uh, Okay. I'm concerned about, <coughs> about the hybrid approach is that if it comes back to the executive committee, I, I'm concerned about the potential optics mm -hmm. of us 
perhaps looking like we're putting our finger on the scale for one side or another of an issue. I, I would prefer to have a, a straight line policy. We either do it for everybody or we don't. Uh, I think the hybrid, while it sounds good on the surface, uh, can lead to nothing but heartache. I, I agree with that. I, we've had some considerable discussion about this. And for me, is if you have a project and you want to stay in the way, so we'll do it. Assuming it's not on the ballot. But I don't think we should be, I don't think, in my feeling, the project <coughs> will so be able to get this through, just like they would not hire a, a transportation consultant. But I don't think we should just be out there for anybody to be on the limit. Just to who's ever developed the project, they can describe the project and put it out. But I don't, I just, I don't like that anybody can come in and ask us to study anything, even though they don't have any kind of an interest in it. Position to something. Sorry if I missed it. Do they pay for that? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's modest though. Yeah. You know, major studies around. Like yeah, so, so this one was probably on the high end because we had a lot of back and forth. It, what it does is it covers the staff time to do those, and I think we were at about $5,000 for this. But what it takes advantage is the big investment that's been made in this regional model, right? So it uses a model that's been built over time, and what we're charging for is just the actual staff time that it takes to run these. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Councilman um, Jones, sorry for that one. I tend to agree with Mayor Voss that the optics aren't good. And we got a big enough target on our back most of the time, so uh, to, to, for us to sit as executive board and decide who does and who doesn't is is not a good thing um, what do you use for what do you use for criteria um, giving special dispensation all of a sudden we become more political than we need to be um, that's one uh, two um, I I prefer that we not get into these issues that are political I think the current policy has a lot of merit um, you know, last time we heard this, I'm going, well, you know, it is public information, but we are using public info, public uh, assets with public employees to serve private interests and um, private interests that can be construed as political. Because on these kinds of studies, and correct me if I'm wrong, the result you get depends upon the assumptions you make going in. And so at the end of it, you know, we, we don't control, if we don't control those assumptions, the, the result is, isn't necessarily something that a lot of people around the board would agree with. And then it's our name that's on the information to be used in the way that the, the, uh, the customer wants it to be. So I, I think we just need to stay out of it uh, and, and, and not get, that get, get tagged with a political uh, position that we really don't want to be in. See, I, I think, let me just share something. I mean, we've been doing these for some time, and, and it's only when you get something that's really controversial. But what happens is, let's say somebody comes in, and they want to uh, do a project in Escondido, and they've got all of their, you know, they, they give us the assumptions we do. They've got to go work with the traffic people in Escondido, and the traffic people in Escondido could, could say, hey, yeah, we see Sandy did this, but you didn't give them all the information, or you didn't look at this properly, or whatever. But it becomes it just it becomes almost like a, a traffic consultant in effect. Right. And so, and, and that's largely worked in the, in the past. T typically, you know, these if a, a project proponent comes in because you know it's their project, they give us the assumptions, we run it through the model, they see the results, they're trying to do a CEQA document so they understand where the impacts are. And it'll iterate back and forth several times where they say, all right, we want to go change this to see if we can reduce this kind of impact. And ultimately, you know, that then becomes a tool that they use to sort of determine what's their best project. And, and I get that part. The part that I'm concerned with is as soon as it becomes political, you've now gone from an analytical process to a soundbite process. And I don't want us to be... Uh, Council Member Jones... There are very few projects in today's world that are not political. 
Well, okay, when I when you say political, I'm thinking something that would do with a, a ballot measure. No, or something we are, like that of course, suggesting we just, I think, is that we want to I, I don't mean that in we a want broad political we sense. I mean in, in elections and yeah. those kinds of things. But that's why I was talking about the at a lower level, more routine kinds of things. We can even, to some extent, we can help the cities by doing these multiple runs that yeah. can help to correct things that, that maybe uh, initially aren't, aren't being uh, handled. And, and, and I get that part. Okay. You know what they say about so you politics, were, you put five people together, you get politics. Yeah. It's, it's no, but you're important. talking about if there's... I'm talking about if we're talking about an election, election or, or, or some sort of a ballot measure or something yeah. like that. So the, the current prohibition is that we don't get involved with those kinds of projects. Those kinds of projects. For either side. Right. For either side, once they've qualified. Right. Yeah. Now, whether we need a defin different definition, whether once they qualified <clears throat> should be the threshold. As I say, Soccer City hadn't qualified, so by our own definition, we, you know, we, we felt like, okay, we got to listen to them. The fact that both sides came in, I was somewhat relieved in, in a sense. Uh, That's a tough one. Just t technically, they were, That's a tough one. they were within the policy. But they were like as close as you get to the line because I think the signatures were being reviewed to mm -hmm. see if they were. I, I forget exactly where it was at, but it was close, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's it formally <laughs> submitted the signatures, so they were certainly in the process, but it hadn't yet qualified. Yeah. So I mean, you could we could revise that slightly so that if the intent is to put something on a ballot and it's you know it's publicly acknowledged, you could and, use that as the and Process right. started. You, you would have to have some sort of process started. Yeah, if the initiative process is started and they're out, somebody's out collecting like signatures. You know where it's I think going. The, yeah. the cutoff needs to be before that. Sooner than yeah. that. Yeah. So you might be able to come up with language, John, that could help us. Certainly, once there's any kind of moving filing, moving line line that, that clearly yeah. back, so <clears throat> we catch what the council member is describing as political, because there's there's going to be some type of. I just want to keep us out of that sound bite roll as much as I can. I would like to see us being a resource than, than doing studies. Um, we have tons of information that would be valuable for any project. Yeah. So why don't we provide the information, you know, this is what we have, and let them do the study, and what would happen if we have legal exposures would we be indemnified if a project goes to court and Rob Sendak provided this study and this and that? So are we exposed legally? To the extent that you merely provide information to them and ultimately they use that information, I don't see that there's any well, involved in the study. Well, ultimately, that's kind of where you are now. You have studies and other people use those studies, and the studies can say a lot of different things depending on how you apply them. So we may be characterizing the word study broader than it is. What's, what's happening here is they, we are using our regional traffic model to run through the model to generate traffic results that then components, or in this case, opponents of the project then use, right? So we have to do the work because we have the model. Yeah, so you're running the model and okay. say, here's the traffic you're going to generate out of this kind of development, right? And it's very valuable to any project. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, well, it, and again, it would be a valuable in the plan because we say, look, you need more lanes for that freeway on the map. You need, you need a different kind of signal system. You, need it. you know, this, to me, this is a, a valuable asset if it's used in a positive way. And that's my concern. And, and I think, you know, this is the data that we have, it's, it's the people's data. I mean, it, this is the public's data, the public's information, and the public's tool, essentially. So I think we have to just figure out a way that we just give raw fact. I'm not sure when the assumptions come in and start making it slant one way or the other, how we stay out of, out of that. But, if, but this is not ours to keep from anybody, I, that is the way I kind of look at it. So, but we have to be careful we don't sway it or skew it <clears throat> so the information favors one side or the other. You know, we don't just accept, I mean, if we, if our staff has questions about the assumptions, those are going to be 
Yes, I mean, we have to have a professionalism. They come in, and it's obvious that they left out half the project. Uh, you know, we're not going to just go ahead and blindly do a study. So, I, you know, I, when I'm saying there's questioning, it's when you get in these intense sort of rivalries. This, this one was quite unique for us. I mean, in most cases, uh, project developer proponent of you know, the developer of that project comes in. You know, they they work with the staff to figure exactly what your project looks like. The results come out, like I said, they iterate back and forth. In this case, because we brought in both the pros and the cons, you know, guys like me and Ray and other folks were actually in the room trying to facilitate them coming to agreement. So there's a lot of disagreements on you know basic assumptions, and so if you you know the the model. The output of the model, whoever uh, pointed that out earlier, Jerry maybe, is that you know, the assumptions you make are going to affect the outcomes of it. And so what we tried to do in this case was to try to reach agreement between both sides as to what those assumptions are. And we're still working on some of those because we're not 100% there yet. So it's, it, this one was extremely complicated and somewhat unique, I think, in our history of doing these. It's Why still, I mean, my our fingerprints are. Yeah, it's our model. My sense is that we would like something, some clarity, so we don't have to bring it back to the executive board and flip a coin. Uh, if, if I'm hearing anything right, why don't we for this? It's not time sensitive. So no, you guys have just asked that we not that we bring this back. Why don't we? Why don't we ask our council to uh, review this in light of maybe changing that uh, the threshold cutoff line, yeah. so to speak, right. in a way that makes it very clear what the intent is. And when the, you know what, what circumstances would uh, would cause that, which keeps us out of the game, but understanding that as a public service, we think there's, there's something of value here that should continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just Mr. Chairman, would make sure we're we're hearing correctly. We're hearing you know you'd like more or less what you got in your policy now, but defining when this process starts and trying to define that in a way that it, it maybe starts earlier so we don't get to the point where it's this last minute stuff that gets us yes we, we can say no earlier yes okay yeah. i got it yeah john, john mm -hmm. okay. can we get the indemnification because you know i know we haven't had any legal issues but in, just in case are we putting indemnifications into the into our Agreements that we have, our standard agreements, I don't know if uh, do those have any indemnification language in them. Yes, they do. Yes, they do? I'd be surprised. Okay, I don't think we need to vote on this. I think it's we'll just give us a reaction. Okay, let's move on then uh, to item number seven. Now we're going to make some working rooms. Victoria is going to Okay. So according, in accordance with board policy, this committee is tasked with annually reviewing the committees and working groups to determine um, functions and membership. Currently, Sandex supports 20 committees and working groups. Attachment 1 on page 40 depicts the relationships between the PACs and the working groups. And attachment 2 on page 44 on your iPad lists the membership roles and responsibilities for the group. This year, we're proposing one change. The Midcoast Corridor Transit Working Group was established to provide input for the development of the environmental documents. Um, the PWG met through um, the environmental phases, and the Federal Transit Administration approved the environmental documents in October of 2014. Um, in addition to um, this report, an informational report is also provided to the SANDAG board per board policy. This is slated for its July 28th meeting. This concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Uh, the chairman of the Mid Coast Working Group would be very appreciative if I could <laughs> say that the work is done. We don't have to have any more meetings. He's having a lot of news. <laughs> and uh, if you can't see your way clear, then I want to ask one of you to volunteer to fill this role. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then we, we should vote on this. Can we don't need to vote on this. Okay, so with your concurrence, if there's no objections, uh, we, will, we will notify all the members that we have 
done away with the committee, and we want to thank them for the meritorious. We have completed the committee. We didn't do away with it. We the sun the committee. Well, they did their work. No, it's it served its role. It was really a, a good group of people that we worked through a lot of issues. We didn't give them cement overshoes, okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we sent everybody an attaboy. Okay. <laughs> With that, uh, the legislative status report, Robin. Yes, good morning. So. Just a brief legislative update today at the state level. Is, line 14th is the last day for non-fiscal bills to pass out of their policy committees. With that in mind, AB 805, the bill that we've been tracking very closely, did meet this threshold. It passed out of the Senate Governance and Finance Committee last week and the Senate Transportation Committee this week. Uh, when it passed out of the Trans Committee this week, it did include several amendments. Firstly, it changed the requirement that the chair of the County and Board of Supervisors serve as their primary representative, so that now it's left completely to the discretion of the board as it is current practice. Secondly, it now includes a, work, a enforceable commitment requirement, which requires that any uh, that uh, it would prohibit SANDAG and the transit agencies from entering into any contract worth a million dollars or more without an enforceable commitment that all that a skilled and trained workforce be to perform all work on the project. This requirement would not apply if a PLA or a performance labor agreement was in place for the project. And lastly, it changed the um, term of the leadership offices for SANDAG so that for the chair and the vice chair positions, instead of serving four-year terms, they would now serve, serve two-year terms. <coughs> the requirement that the mayors, thank you, of the two largest cities still serve as the chair and vice chair remains in the bill, but now instead of four years, it's two years. Um, I should also mention the author's office has said this is a mistake in the drafting and that they intend to correct it, but because it is in print, I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware. As you know, the current voting system proposed under the bill uh, essentially provides for an override mechanism. So you would take a tally vote, and then a weighted vote could be called. Um, before, it said that four jurisdictions comprising a majority of the vote would then supersede the tally vote. Now it says that four members um, with comprising a majority of the weighted vote would supersede the tally vote. Um, so th again, they said that this is something that they will be fixing in the future, but it's just something to be aware of. And then lastly, in the Transportation Committee hearing this week, um, the author, Assemblymember Gonzalez Fletcher, did make a commitment to Senator Atkins that she would be changing the leadership provision um, so that it would no longer mandate the two mayors of the, the largest cities, but instead be left to a proportional vote. Um, that language is not in print as of today, so we will wait to see if that develops um, in the remainder of the legislative session. That's it for the state portion at the federal level. We just want to make sure that everyone is aware that the NOFO, or essentially the call for projects for the, uh, let me get this name right, Nationally Significant Freight and Highway Projects Program, previously known as Fast Lane, now known as Infra, as an in infrastructure, has been released. Um, there's $1.5 billion available that, that's um, using FY17 and 18 funding. Uh, applications are due November 2nd. They're looking for the same types of projects that they were looking for in the first two rounds, but the selection criteria has changed to reflect some of the administration's priorities. Not surprisingly, they want to make sure that any projects um, are benefiting the economy, both at the regional and the national level, that they're using innovative approaches, and that they're leveraging federal funding to the maximum extent po uh, possible, especially with a focus on utilizing the private sector investment and participation in any project. Um, so we encourage everyone to apply. We will be coming back with future reports about what SANDAG intends to submit under this round as well. And I'm happy to end up answering any questions you may have. Any questions? A quick questions on the infra. <laughs> Good job. Is that uh, still a requirement of uh, matching funds? Yes, it still has the same matching requirements. Well, do you know what the uh, percentage is? It's a total, it's a 2080, so 80% total federal funding on the project, and I can't remember for in particular, 60-40. 60-40. But since, since the feds are trying to leverage, I suspect that as these projects get put forward, I mean, that's the for the baseline, right? And so if they're trying to leverage dollars, they'll probably look for you know, those projects that are going to maximize the federal leverage. Okay. I guess I have a question back on AB 805. What was the, what was the part? It sounded like a PLA was sneaking under the tent. So essentially, we are prohibited from entering into any construction contracts that are worth a million dollars or more unless an enforceable commitment that a skilled and trained workforce is going to be used on the project. What's an enforceable commitment? It's, it's called a project labor agreement. That's right. It's, okay. That's another word for it. Okay.
So what it what it requires, Mayor Desmond, and, and we talked about this during Measure A, is it requires that the workforce have participated through a state approved apprenticeship program at levels, and then it requires the contractors to you know, approve that. So they got to do a lot of reporting, and then it requires our tracking of that since it's our contract, uh, and then it provides. Uh, an alternative method so if you don't want to go through all that one of the ways you can avoid all the tracking and all the stuff is you can enter into a project labor agreement okay. and that's you know other parts of the state law that's already in place today so it's not like brand new they, they in and that was in me our measure a no no we it was no, not you guys that's not we, that we couldn't get there but okay. in this case they're proposing to put it in the law right okay and then what was it, the part about four members overriding a, a, a tally vote? Any four members of the what, sub regional? Four members. Any four members can, can call for an, a, a weighted vote. So it's two members to call for it, and then once you have the weighted vote, if four members that comprise a majority of the weighted vote approve the measure. <coughs> four members that comprise a majority of the weighted vote. Again, they're saying it's still meant to be four jurisdictions instead of four members, because as you know, the county has two members, the city has two members, um, but as it's drafted now, it's four members, not four any, jurisdictions. Any four members. But even if that, uh, let's say, San Diego or the county, are the members are split, the overriding, just one member of that uh, uh, city or county, it, it automatically uses the entire weighted vote. Correct. No. No. It's not the case. At the weighted vote, but no. the jurisdictional no, it, it meets the jurisdictional requirement, right. but it does not bring vote. along all of the weight from that jurisdiction. That's not what it sounded like, though. That's what I was asking. I think that's why she's going to clarify that. And she's going to go, I think, from members to jurisdictions, right? Mm -hmm. so I know, but that when you split, when you take away the, the member part of it, though, and you go strictly with the jurisdiction, that means that so. I, I guess it, it's complicated to me where you say uh, the split of jurisdiction. So does that mean like you know you have uh, Merle and and, and uh, Lori and they decide they're going to go their separate ways on that issue? John, there's got to be clarifying language, right? You? <coughs> okay. And then you'll be yeah. the last puzzle, right? I'll make sure with you uh, okay. a week ago, Gary and I and uh, Terry Sinag uh, went and had a private meeting over what we thought of the major issue. It was really the biggest issue was the governments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were trying to suggest ways that, you know, that we could work this out. Um, she kind of keeps going back, well, it should be one person, one vote, you know, very democratic. And I said, well, if, if you're doing that, then why would you have Chula Vista in the second position in the unincorporated part of the county county. Is over twice as big as Chula Vista. That doesn't sound very democratic. But I said, I'm not, I'm not asking for that because I don't think it's the right idea anyway. And what, what we were suggesting is a different, maybe a different approach that she might consider where, you know, if you got to a two-thirds weighted vote, then that would overrule, that would become the, the vote irrespective. I think there was a concern that a lot of smaller entities could block things from happening. So we're, we're trying to work with her. I, I'm not optimistic, but uh, you know, your, your question's a good one, but I think you'll see that clarified. You know, one thing that's been missing in all this discussion is is, is um, kind of the interests of the, of the subregions. Uh, because one thing hasn't been talked about in all of this is is that you really don't want any one subregion to dominate in in how we look at our regional uh, transportation system. So you, you know we've you know one person one vote leaves out jurisdictional entities or cities, but we haven't talked about those subregions. Yeah, yeah. Sub yeah. I haven't heard it anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you guys may have talked about it, but I haven't. Yeah. And, and the whole idea, in fact, we prep it. <coughs> What we're really trying to do is create a regional system. I mean, yeah, we've people got don't stay within their sub-regions or their city. They, you know, people are traveling all over. All of our studies show how the travel patterns are. And yeah, you, you know, some people in the region may only have to take a bus a couple blocks to work, but that's not the norm. And 
and to the extent that you know people live in one place and work in another, we want people to have access to jobs. We want them to be able to we want their ability through the whole county. That's the answer here, and I, and I, and I mean that's why I'm so committed to this. Is, you know, I live close by. You know, I don't travel far, but I think that for the well-being of the whole community, I think with the direction of going is, you know, is going to be paralyzing in the, in the future. I really do. Is yeah, I'm retired, Ron. I'm two blocks from the Home Depot. I could drive on a dirt road and be happy. Okay. Okay. So you know, my arguments aren't for me. No, I understand, and that's what I think all of us have more of a regional perspective in any event. Quick question about PLAs. Um, how does the proposed change differ from what we're doing on a regular basis now? I mean, the question is, are most of our projects over a million dollars already already involved in PLAs? So I think that uh, Mayor Wells, the short answer is no, because we don't we don't require a PLA, right? We require that our contractors, because we co-mingle dollars, that they pay prevailing wage rate, right? So and then, right. so the contractor themselves decide whether uh, whether they're going to enter into labor agreements with with, the, with labor. So but we're not labor exclusive. If a contractor that was non-labor, as long as they provide, paid prevailing wage rate, that would be fine with our contracts. So, so, so but I would, having said that, if you look at the size and magnitude of most of our contracts, that most of the big contractors are getting their workforce from labor and they got agreements that they have with uh, labor. So it doesn't change the dollars out very much. It just it changes the politics of it. Well, I think there, there may be some cost because if, if you are tracking the skilled workforce, something that we don't necessarily track today, so that's something that we'd have to take into account and figure out if the contractor's having to do it, then he's going to put it in his or her price. And if we're having to, you know, validate and track that, well, we'll have to add staff and team to do that. Thanks. That's a good answer to the question. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, this is an information item. Thank you, Robin. This is the last item on our agenda. Comments and adjourn. August 11th to August 14th. Time to retire. Okay, thank you.